Second Nature, Brain Science and Human Knowledge by Gerald Edelman. Preface. This book was prompted by my efforts, desultory and otherwise, to understand how progress in brain science bears on issues of human knowledge. The results of my thoughts on these issues are couched in more lenient and heterogeneous terms than those of philosophers dedicated to traditional epistemology. I consider this difference to be a useful starting point for further explorations of how we know. A casual glance at the table of contents will reveal that I also consider that the understanding of consciousness is critical to the enterprise. With this in mind, here is how I propose to proceed. First, I will argue that a number of important consequences ensue if we show how consciousness is based in brain action. In doing so, I shall assume that we do understand this basis and I will lay out the implications of such an understanding. I will then describe some of the essential features of the brain and the concepts necessary to understanding how it works. With this description in hand, we can address the nature of consciousness itself. We will then be in a position to revisit the consequences for science and human knowledge of our understanding of the grounds of consciousness. In realizing this project, I intend to avoid technical details. I have covered these extensively in other books and papers. Instead, in describing the brain, I shall rely as much as possible on concrete examples and metaphors. I urge the reader to look at this work as an initial exploratory effort designed to prompt new thoughts on how we come to know the world and ourselves. Many gaps remain, and much more must be accomplished in birth, both neuroscience and psychology before a comprehensive picture of thought and knowledge can be glimpsed. Consider what follows to be a few first strokes. Introduction From time to time I have a dream. In it, the historian Henry Adams appears, moaning about complexity, muttering about the virgin and the dynamo. There usually is no more to the dream than that. When I remember enough detail in my waking state, I connect it to the famous chapter in The Education of Henry Adams. In that chapter, Adams recounts his sense of inadequacy before the 40-foot dynamos that his friend Langley, the engineer, showed him at the Paris Exhibition of 1900. Adams contrasts the complexity of these engines to the simplicity of the religious turn to the Virgin Mary. That theme, its variations, and Adams' sense of not being comfortable in his time run through the education. Adams, a scion of the great family descended from John Adams, was an accomplished historian. His sense of alienation prompts speculation. Could it have simply been the symptom of clinical depression? Could it have been entwined with the circumstances leading to his wife's suicide? Or could it have reflected a genuine rift between the way a person sees the world from the standpoint of science and the way that person sees it reflected in the humanities? We do not know, but one thing is sure, there is a divorce between science and the humanities, and between the so-called hard sciences such as physics and the human sciences such as sociology. Perhaps my recurrent dreams of Henry Adams come from my persistent interest in the origin of this estrangement. I have long puzzled over the gap between scientific explanations and everyday experience, whether by individuals or in historical settings. Is the divorce between science and the humanities inevitable? Can the human sciences be reconciled with the hard sciences? Views on these questions have ranged widely, and some might say that they aren't worth bothering with. As this book attests, I believe the opposite, that understanding how we arrive at knowledge, whether by scientific inquiry, by reason, or by happenstance, is of major importance. Wrongheadedness, severe reductionism, or insouciance can each have unfortunate long-range consequences for human welfare. This book is a result of a line of thought leading to what I have called brain-based epistemology. This term refers to efforts to ground the theory of knowledge in an understanding of how the brain works. It is an extension of the notion of naturalized epistemology, a proposal made by the philosopher Willard Van Orman Queen. My line of argument differs from his, which stopped as it were at the skin and other sensory receptors. I deal with the issue by considering a wider ranging interaction, that between brain, body, and environment. I believe that above all, it is particularly important to understand the basis of consciousness. Queen, with his usual ironic candor, said, quote, I have been accused of denying consciousness, but I am not conscious of having done so. Consciousness is to me a mystery and not one to be dismissed. We know what it is like to be conscious, but not how to put it into satisfactory scientific terms. Whatever it precisely may be, consciousness is a state of the body, a state of nerves. The line I am urging today 
as today's conventional wisdom is not a denial of consciousness. It is often called, with more reason, a repudiation of mind. It is called a repudiation of mind as a second substance over and above body. It can be described less harshly as an identification of mind with some of the faculties, states, and activities of the body. Mental states and events are a special subclass of the states and events of the human or animal body. End quote. I believe we are now in a position to reduce the mystery. In this book, I lay out thoughts that reveal this position and bear directly on how we know, on how we discover and create, and on our search for truth. I follow in the footsteps of William James, who pointed out that consciousness is a process whose function is knowing. There is nature and human nature. How do they intersect? The title I have chosen reflects this question and is, to some extent, a play on words. The term second nature usually refers to an act done spontaneously, easily, and without the need for exertion or learning. I use the term here to include this meaning, but also to call attention to the fact that our thoughts often float free of our realistic descriptions of nature. They are a second nature. I aim to explore here how nature and second nature interact. Chapter 1 the Galean Arc and Darwin's Program. Quote, Almost everything that distinguishes the modern world from earlier centuries is attributable to science, which achieved its most spectacular triumphs in the 17th century. Bertrand Russell. Quote, the origin of species introduced a mode of thinking that in the end was bound to transform the logic of knowledge and hence the treatment of morality, politics, and religion. John Dewey. Quote, Something definite happens when to a certain brain state, a certain consciousness corresponds. William James. Henry Adams didn't know the half of what was coming, but he did sense a transformation of our existence by scientific technology. We are in the midst of a revolution. Communication, computers, the internet, the explosion of travel by land and air, atomic power, biological manipulation of our genetic makeup, one could go on and on about the technological substrate and the globalization that has changed the pace of our lives, the modes of our thought, our place in nature, and our threat to it. What has happened to our conception of nature and of our second nature? To answer this question, we have to take a longer view of Western science, particularly of physics and biology. I pick two figures, Galileo Galilei and Charles Darwin, to highlight the developments that have so changed our lives. First, Galileo, who can be taken to represent the birth in the 17th century of modern physics, the broadest of modern sciences. The philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, in his book, Science in the Modern World, called Galileo's achievement, quote, the quiet commencement of the most intimate change in outlook which the human race had yet encountered, end quote. Surely we must be impressed by the arc of modern physics ranging from Galileo's ideas on the heavens and his experiments on inertia to our present cosmology and theories of matter, we must confront the weird domain of the very small described by quantum mechanics as well as the, second, as the grand elegance of general relativity as it opens up vistas of the very large, the universe itself. So now the Galilean arc ranges from nuclear power to solid state physics, to the exploration of space, and to the origin of the universe itself in the Big Bang. Even before these advances, a vision of the basis of life, the evolution of living things, was laid down by Charles Darwin in the second half of the 19th century. Darwin's development of the idea of natural selection provided the theoretical basis for understanding life itself, particularly when it was coupled with Mendelian genetics in the 20th century. The further development of molecular biology in the latter part of this century has made it possible to change the very basis of biological reproduction. In looking over the domains of nature, it may appear that, if we include Darwin, the Galilean arc has provided an enlightened understanding of all major subject categories, galaxies, stars and planets, the structure of matter, the nature of genes and biological evolution. Henry Adams' plate today would be more than full of scientific matters covering much of our existence. But there is a gap, or an incompleteness, in the Galilean arc. We have not yet scientifically founded the basis of consciousness in the brain, an issue that until recently has been left to the philosophers. There are re reasons for this. Until recently, non-invasive methods of examining events in the brain were lacking. More than that, consciousness is a first-person affair, whereas the objective methodology of science is a third-person affair. Opinions, subjectivity, and the like cannot be admitted in scientific experiments. 
An equally large factor affecting the scientific approach to consciousness can be attributed to the influential thoughts of René Descartes. Sometime after Galileo, Descartes essentially removed the mind from nature. He did this by thought alone, concluding that there were two substances, res extensa, extended things that were susceptible to physics, and res cog cogitans, thinking things that were not extended in space and that were unavailable to physics. Descartes' dualism it, and its various subsequent derivations have had a profound effect on the approach to consciousness as a valid scientific target. This state of affairs is most curious. In principle, no subject is a priori immune from scientific inquiry, yet the very ground of our awareness has been left outside the pale. Science is an imagination in the service of the verifiable truth, and as such, imagination is actually dependent on consciousness. Science itself is so dependent. As the great physicist Erwin Schrödinger observed, no scientific theory in physics includes sensations and perceptions, and to get ahead it must therefore assume these phenomena as being outside of science's grasp. Must we accept this state of affairs? Or can science complete the Galilean art? If it cannot, must it leave the ground of consciousness to the philosophers, to the humanities, and thereby acquiesce to the divorce that so concerned Henry Adams? Thanks to discoveries about the brain and advances in brain theory in the past 20 years, it seems we do not have to remain in this predicament. We can study consciousness even in the face of subjectivity. My aim here is to show how. But first, let us turn to the significance of a scientific understanding of consciousness. I have found that some people do not believe that a scientific account of consciousness offers much in the way of consequences. My remarks here are not specifically aimed at these doubters, but I hope they will persuade some at least to consider the contrary position. I start with a big assumption that we have a satisfactory scientific theory of consciousness based on brain activity. What would its significance be? First, it would clarify the relation between mental and physical events and clear up some outstanding philosophical puzzles. We would no longer have to consider dualism, panpsychism, mysterianism, and spooky forces as worth pursuing. Time would be saved at the least and in clarifying these issues, we would have a better view of our place in the natural world. We would be able to corroborate Darwin's theory that the human mind is the outcome of natural selection and therefore complete his program. We would also have a better picture of the basis of human illusions, useful and otherwise. One illusion I hope to dispel is the notion that our brains are computers and that consciousness could emerge from computation. Furthermore, a successful theory of consciousness might clarify the place of values in a world of facts. In connection with both of these issues, a brain-based theory would be of great use in understanding psychiatric and neuropsychological syndromes and diseases. Tangent to these matters, a brain-based theory might contribute to our notions of creativity. It might even provide a clearer view of the connection of objective descriptions derived from hard science to normative issues that arise in aesthetics and ethics. To that degree, it may help undo the divorce between science and the humanities. Above all, achieving these ends may contribute to and affect the formulation of a biologically based epistemology, an account of knowledge that relates truth to opinion and belief, and thought to emotion by including aspects of brain-based subjectivity in an analysis of human knowledge. The most remarkable outcome of a satisfactory brain theory would be the construction of a conscious artifact. Although that goal is presently in the realm of fantasy, scientists at the Neurosciences Institute in La Jolla, California have already built brain-based devices that have perceptual and memorial capacities. Of course, a minimum requirement for us to believe that we had constructed a conscious device would rest in its ability to report through a language its internal phenomenal states while we measure its neural and bodily performance. This requirement is presently far from being met. But if it were, we would have an unparalleled opportunity to explore brain, body, and the environment as they interact in such a device. Would it see or sense the world in ways we cannot imagine? Only a receipt of messages from outer space would exceed this enterprise and excitement. We shall have to wait. I propose now to provide some support for the assumption I made that we have a satisfactory theory of consciousness. I shall do so by presenting a brief account of consciousness and of the brain dynamics from which it emerges. Following that, we can return to analyze their consequences in greater detail. Chapter 2, Consciousness, Body, and Brain. 
quote, Like the entomologist in search of brightly colored butterflies, my attention hunted in the garden of gray matter, cells with delicate and elegant forms, the mysterious butterflies of the soul. Santiago Raman I. Cajal. I have written extensively on the details of brain structure and dynamics as they relate to perception, memory, and consciousness. I have no intention of repeating these details here. Instead, I shall describe some of the main features of consciousness. Then I will give a brief account of brain activity in terms of a theory called neural Darwinism. This will allow me to show how consciousness emerges from brain dynamics. I shall not hesitate to make large statements without detailed proof. Such proof can be found elsewhere. We all know implicitly, implicitly what consciousness is. It is what you lose on entering a dreamless deep sleep and, less commonly, deep anesthesia or coma. And it is what you will regain after emerging from these states. In the awake conscious state, you experience a unitary scene composed variably of sensory responses, sights, sounds, smell, and so on, as well as images, memories, feeling tones, and emotions a sense of willing or agency, a feeling of situatedness, and other aspects of awareness. Being conscious is a unitary experience in the sense that you cannot at any time become totally aware of just one thing to the complete exclusion of others. But you can direct your attention to various aspects of a less inclusive but still unitary scene. Within a short time that scene will vary in one degree or another and, though still integrated, will become differentiated yielding a new scene. The extraordinary fact is that the number of such privately experienced scenes is apparently limitless. The transitions seem to be continuous, and in their complete detail they are private, first-person subjective experiences. Conscious states are often, but not always, about things or events, a property called intentionality. But they do not necessarily always show this property. They can, for example, be about a mood. There is often a just-aware fringe, as William James called, certain barely perceived states. Conscious states can also involve the awareness of agency or the willing of an action. The property most often described as particularly mysterious is the phenomenal aspect of consciousness, the experience of qualia. Qualia are, for example, the greenness of green and the warmness of warmth. But several students of the subject, myself included, go beyond these simple qualities and consider that the whole ensemble of conscious scenes or experiences to the qualia. Many consider explaining qualia to be the acid test of a consciousness theory. How can we explain not only qualia but all the other features of consciousness? The answer I propose is to look into how the brain works, formulating a global brain theory that can be extended to explain consciousness. Before I do so, however, one, must dis one more distinction will prove useful. As human beings, we know what it is like to be conscious. Moreover, we are conscious of being conscious and can report on our experience. Although we cannot experience the consciousness of members of another species, we surmise that animals like dogs are conscious. We do this on the basis of their behavior and the close similarity of their brains to ours. But we do not usually attribute consciousness of consciousness to them. This is the basis for a useful distinction. Dogs and other mammals, if they are aware, have primary consciousness. This is the experience of a unitary scene in a time period of, at the most, seconds that I call re the remembered present, a bit like the illumination by a flashlight beam in a dark room. Although they are aware of ongoing events, animals with primary consciousness are not conscious of being conscious and do not have a concept of the past, the future, or a nameable self. Such notions require the ability to experience higher order consciousness, and this depends on having semantic or symbolic capabilities. Chimpanzees appear to have the rudiments of these capabilities. In our case, they exist in full flower because we have syntax and true language. With the ability to speak, we can free ourselves temporarily from the limitations of the remembered present. Nonetheless, at all times when higher order consciousness is present, we also possess primary consciousness. Against this background, let us turn to the organ responsible for all these extraordinary traits, the brain. The human brain weighs about three pounds. It is one of the most complicated material objects in the known universe. Its connectivity is awe-inspiring. The wrinkled cortical mantle of the brain has about 30 billion nerve cells or neurons and 1 million billion connections. 
The number of possible active pathways of such a structure far exceeds the number of elementary particles in the known universe. This is not the place to go into detail about how the brain gives rise to consciousness. I have done that in several books, which may be consulted. But I do want to provide a working picture of brain structure and activity. I propose to use a mixture of down-to-earth description, analogy, and metaphor. Just enough to give an idea of how consciousness arises. To start with, let's consider the fundamental cells that carry in signals in the brain. They are the neurons, which have a tree-like set of branches, dendrites, and usually a single extended process, the axon, that serves to connect one neuron to another. This connection, called the synapse, is a critical element in ensuring the function of brain circuits. This is so because the electricity traveling down the axon releases little packets of chemicals called neurotransmitters at the synapse. These chemicals cross the small distance inside the synapse and bind to certain receptors present often at the dendrites of the receiving cell. If the release happens often enough, the receiving or postsynaptic cell fires and can repeat the process and signal yet another cell. Imagine such a process summing up across a myriad of synapses and you will get an idea of why with modern methods we can actually record the otherwise minute currents and potentials over the scalp. Neurophysiologists can in fact record more precisely from single cells by invading the brain and inserting microscopic electrodes within individual neurons. A key property of synapses is that they are plastic. Various activities and biochemical events can change their strength. These changes can in turn determine which neuronal pathways are selected to transmit signals. Patterns of such changes in synaptic strength provide a basis for memory. At this point, it may be useful to mention that synapses come in two flavors, excitatory and inhibitory. Both can exhibit plasticity. Together, they help select the functioning signal pathways of the brain. Now, an important next step is this valdorized account is to point out that the overall anatomical connections and pathways in the brain of a given animal species are selected during evolution and development. The result is a stunning set of different brain areas and cell collections called nuclei. Each of these has both short-range and long-range inputs and outputs. Let us look at the visual pathway in monkeys as an example. Light striking cells in the retina excites the optic nerve whose signals ultimately reach a structure called the thalamus, a central player in our story. The thalamus is a small structure that is of great importance in any account of consciousness. Thalamic neurons mediating vision send axons to an area of the cerebral cortex called V1. From there, all kinds of pathways within the cortex are elaborated to areas called V2, V3, and V4, among others. Indeed, at least 33 different cortical areas are involved in one way or another in the process of vision. Two important facts about this and several other sensory systems have emerged. The first is that, in general, each brain area is functionally segregated. In vision, V1 for orientation of objects, V4 for color, V5 for object motion. The second fact is that there is no one area controlling and coordinating the responses of all the rest when a complex visual signal comes from, say, a colored moving object of a particular shape. As we shall see, the brain nevertheless has means to coordinate the segregated perceptual events that occur when such a stimulus strikes the retina. The net result of such coordination is perceptual categorization, the carving up of the world of inputs into objects significant for a given animal species recognition. The brain carries out pattern recognition. We could go on about sensory systems other than vision, but the principles are similar even if their receptors and inputs differ. What about outputs? Well, different sensory areas connect to higher areas in the cortex so that the brain speaks mainly to itself. Of course, one set of cortical areas sends motor output signals to the spinal cord and thence to our muscles to elicit various actions and movements. Furthermore, the cortex receives additional inputs from and yields outputs to a number of subcortical structures besides the thalamus. These include the basal ganglia and cerebellum, which to help regulate movement, and the hippocampus, which helps establish long-term memory of events and episodes by interacting with the cortex. So far, what I have said would superficially be thought to describe a system analogous to an electronic device such as a computer. 
Indeed, in many scientific circles, there remains a widespread belief that the brain is a computer. This belief is mistaken for a number of reasons. First, the computer works by using logic and arithmetic in very short intervals regulated by a clock. As we shall see, the brain does not operate, operate by logical rules. To function, a computer must receive unambiguous input signals, but signals to various sensory receptors of the brain are not so organized. The world, which is not carved beforehand into prescribed categories, is not a piece of coded tape. Second, the brain order that I have briefly described is enormously variable at its finest levels. As neural currents develop, variant individual experiences leave imprints such that no two brains are identical, even those of identical twins. This is so in large measure because, during the development and establishment of neuroanatomy, neurons that fire together wire together. Furthermore, there is no evidence for a computer program consisting of effective procedures that would control a brain's input, output, and behavior. Artificial intelligence doesn't work in real brains. There is no logic and no precise clock governing the outputs of our brains, no matter how regular they may appear. Last, it should be stressed that we are not born with enough genes to specify the synaptic complexity of higher brains like ours. Of course, the fact that we have human brains and not chimpanzee brains does depend on our gene networks. But these gene networks, like those in the brain themselves, are enormously variable since their various expression patterns depend on environmental context and individual experience. If the mammalian brain is not a computer, what is it? How does it work? We must answer these questions before we can explain the brain basis of consciousness. Chapter 3, Selectionism a prerequisite for consciousness. Quote, Theories have four stages of acceptance. One, this is worthless nonsense. Two, this is an interesting but perverse point of life. Three, this is true but quite unimportant. Four, I always said so. J.B.S. Haldane. The descriptions I have given of consciousness in the brain now have to be connected in a satisfactory way. This will require the presentation of a theory that accounts for coherent brain action in the absence of computation. It will also entail the exploration of a number of essential concepts that are likely to be unfamiliar. To make them understandable, I am going to use a number of biological examples and some non-biological analogies. I will then connect them to our main task, to see how consciousness evolved and how it arises in individual brains. Before we turn to theoretical issues, we must not lose sight of one set of facts. The brain is embodied and the body is embedded. First, consider embodiment. All of the activities that I described in the last chapter depend on signals to the brain from the body and from the brain to the body. The brain's maps and connections are altered not only by what you sense, but by how you move. In turn, the brain regulates fundamental biological functions of your body's organs in addition to controlling the motions and actions that guide your senses. These functions include fundamental aspects of sex, breathing, heartbeat, and so on, as well as the responses that accompany emotion. If we include the brain as your favorite organ, you are your body. Second, consider embeddedness. Your body is embedded and situated in a particularly in particular environment influencing it and being influenced by it. This set of interactions defines your eco-niche, as it is called. It is well to remember that the human species evolved along with the brain in a sequence of such niches. I emphasize these facts because, for brevity, I will often talk of the brain without reference to the other two members of the critical triad, the body and the eco-niche. Remember when that happens that the critical triad is still at the back of my mind. Now to the theory to provide a basis for understanding consciousness. Such a theory must account for both the diversity and the regular, regularity of brain responses in the absence of the control by logic and a precise clock that are the hallmarks of a computer. Where can we turn after relinquishing the notion of computation? The answer is provided by turning to Darwin's fundamental idea of population thinking. Darwin proposed that categories of characters or of species could arise by selection from a population of variant individuals, individuals having different traits. According to a seminal idea of natural selection, competition within and between species would result in the survival and the reproduction of those individuals that were, on the average, fitter than others. 
As a result, their progeny and, as we now know, their genes would survive. Natural selection is differential reproduction. The extraordinary concept that Darwin put forth was that variation in a population is not just noise, but in fact provides a substrate for selection and possible survival. All of this takes place in evolution over millions of years. But can a selective system work within the lifetime of an individual? We now know that it can. The immune system of vertebrates is a, is a selective system. Your body recognizes shapes of foreign molecules, such as portions of bacteria or viruses, or even of simpler organic compounds, through a system of molecules called antibodies. These proteins circulate in your blood and are also present on the surface of the central cells of immunity called lymphocytes. Immunologists, confronted with the fact that antibodies could bind and even distinguish foreign molecules that never existed before, came up with an instructive theory. It proposed that an antibody, as it was formed, would fold around the shape of the injected foreign molecule or antigen. The antigen would then be removed, leaving a cavity complementary to its shape. The antibody would then bind to this antigen on future encounters. The idea was beguilingly simple, and it turned out to be wrong. In fact, it turned out that the immune recognition takes place by selection, not by instruction. Within each lymphocyte in your body, the gene of, for an antibody undergoes variation by mutation and a process called recombination. The result is that the part of the antibody protein that can bind to a foreign antigen on the surface of a given cell is distinctive and unique. Inasmuch as there are as many as 100 billion lymphocytes, each with one kind of antibody on its surface, a diverse population is formed. When a foreign antigen binds to one or more of the cells via the antibodies that fit its shape, those cells get a signal to divide and produce more of that antibody. The outcome is that the subsequent exposures to the immunizing antigen result in speedy binding and neutralization by the much larger number of specific antibodies. I know this system well, having spent a good portion of my research life on this exquisite selectional system, and therefore with my colleagues having worked out the chemical structure of antibodies. What can we learn from the examples of evolution and immunity? First, we see that there must be a generator of diversity, God. Next, there must be a challenge by the environment confronting a species with competition, evolution, or a body with foreign molecules, immunity. Third, there must be differential amplification or reproduction of those variants that are fitter in evolution or that fit as an antigen binding. But note that the mechanisms by which these three principles operate are not the same in the, the two cases. We can exploit this conclusion by suggesting that the brain, like the immune system, is a selection system that operates within an individual's lifetime. I proposed this notion in 1977 and elaborated it subsequently under the name Neural Darwinism. The theory has three tenets. The first is that the development of neuronal circuits in the brain leads to enormous microscopic anatomical variation that is a result of a process of continual selection. A major driving force for this developmental selection is the fact that even in the fetus, neurons that fire together wire together. Two dis Two distant neurons will, for example, make synaptic connections if their firing patterns are temporarily correlated. Second, an additional and overlapping set of selective events occurs when the repertoire of anatomical circuits that are formed receive signals because of an animal's behavior or experience. This experiential selection occurs through changes in the strength of, of the synapses that already exist in the brain anatomy. Some synapses are strengthened and some are weakened. It is as if police officers stationed at a particular synapse facilitate signaling from axon to dendrite, while at other synapses, police officers would reduce such signaling. The resultant combinations of signal paths that can be followed in the brain are vast in number, as are the neuronal groups that constitute the selected elements. The net result of developmental and experiential selection is that some neural circuits are favored over others, but since we abandon the computer with its logic and clock, how do we get coherent behavior out of the system? And what biases the system to yield adaptive responses? The answer to the first question lies in the third tenet of the theory, which proposes a process called reentry. Reentry is the continual signaling from one brain region or map to another and back again across massively parallel fibers, axons. 
that are known to be omnipresent in higher brains. Re-entrant signal paths constantly change with the speed of thought. A net effect of this re-entrant traffic is the time-locked or synchronizing firing of neuronal groups in particular circuits. This provides the coordination in time and space that would otherwise have to be assured by some form of computation. To help imagine how re-entry works, consider a hypothetical string quartet made up of, will of willful musicians. Each place has or her own tune with different rhythm. Now connect the bodies of all the players with very fine threads, many to, of them to all body parts. As each player moves, he or she will unconsciously send waves of movement to the others. In a short time, the rhythm and to some extent the mel melodies will become more coherent. The dynamics will continue, leading to new coherent output. Something like this also occurs in jazz improvisation, of course, without the threads. The theory of neuronal group selection, TNGS, or neural Darwinism, needs one more provision to answer the question about adaptive responses. For successful adaptation, some biases must regulate the outcome of developmental and experiential selection coordinated by reentry. It turns out that, in such species, this bias is inherited in the form of value systems present in the brain as a result of natural selection. Each of these value systems releases a type of neurotransmitter or neuromodulator under particular circumstances. One example is the so-called locus coriolis, a small collection of neurons on each side of the brainstem. These neurons send their axons into the brain and spinal cord, distributed somewhat like a hairnet for the brain. On receipt of salient startle signals, say a loud noise, these neurons release a neurotransmitter called noradrenaline into the surrounding space as if from a leaky garden hose. The result can lower the threshold of synaptic responses of multiple neurons, leading to more firing as well as to changes in the synaptic strengths among those neurons. Similarly, there is a value system that releases the neurotransmitter dopamine. This system is found in the basal ganglia and the brainstem. The release of dopamine acts as a reward system, facilitating learning. Other systems release different neurotransmitters. Those releasing serotonin can govern mood, and those releasing acetylcholine can alter thresholds in waking and sleeping. The combination of value systems activity, along with the selectional synaptic changes in specific networks of neuronal groups, governs behavior. Selection within these networks determines the categories of an individual animal's behavior, Value systems provide the biases and rewards. We now see that the brains have a gener generator of diversity, God, encounter signals from an unknown world through the repertoires of neuronal groups and facilitate different amplification of the connections of those groups of neurons that are adapted. We conclude that our brains are clear-cut examples of selectional systems. Notice that, given the tenets of neural Darwinism, each brain is necessarily unique in its anatomical structure and its dynamics. Even the brains of twins will differ. I won't discuss the evidence supporting the neural Darwinism. Instead, I will simply state that many experiments have revealed the variance in developmental selection, the importance of synaptic strength changes in learning and memory, and the contribution of reentry to coordination of the activity of brain regions through synchronization of their circuits. In the view of neural Darwinism, multiple functionally segregated brain areas, such as the cortical regions devoted to vision, are bound in their response by reentry. Cortical area V1 is dedicated to the orientation of a stimulus, area V4 to its color, and area V5 to its motion. These and a score of other areas have no supervisor. Instead, they are reentrally connected by reciprocal fibers. Combinations of responses among these areas give rise to a unified precept, for example, of a tilted red cylindrical moving object. This precept arises from the activity of synchronously, synchronously firing circuits that bind the responses of various segregated regions together. According to the theory, memory of such an event is a dynamic system property in which synaptic strengthening and weakening enhances the re-engagement of some of the original circuits. But now there is no signal from the original object. Instead, there is stimulation within the brain of a subject of re-entrant circuits to yield an image or thought of the object upon memory recall. In this case, the image is brought up by means of the brain speaking to itself. 
Memory, which is recategorization influenced by value systems, trades off ultimate precision for associative power. One final concept is necessary to account for such associative recall. Brain circuits under selection must be degenerate. Degeneracy refers to situations in which different structures can yield the same output or consequence. A good example is the genetic code. Each triplet of bases in DNA specifies a particular one of the 20 amino acids that go to make up proteins. Since there are four chemically different bases, there are 64 possible triplets. However, since there are only 20 different amino acids, the code must be degenerate. Any of the four bases, G, C, A, or T, may occupy the third position in each triplet, in many cases without changing the amino acid specified. There are on average about three, 64 divided by 20, ways to code any one amino acid. So if a string of 300 bases specifies a sequence of 100 different amino acids making up a protein, any of roughly 3 to the power of 100 different base sequences can specify the same protein sequence. The code is degenerate. Degeneracy is seen at many levels of biological organization, ranging from properties of cells up to those of language. It is an essential property of selectional systems which would be likely to fail without it. So we must expect that, in perception and memory, many different circuits of neuronal groups could and do give a similar output. If one circuit fails to function, another is likely to work. The significance of this observation goes beyond the fail-safe properties of degenerate circuits. Degeneracy in brain circuits leads almost inevitably to association, a key property required for memory and learning. This associative property occurs because of the overlap of different degenerate circuits leading to a similar output. If input signals change, the existence of that overlap can also result in association with different circuits having different outputs. A selectional theory such as neural Darwinism necessarily posits enormously diverse repertoires of neuronal groups. It explains how combinations of such groups can bound into integrated wholes depending on diverse inputs from the body, the world, and the brain itself. As we shall see, these are just the properties needed to account for the enormously rich yet unitary properties of the conscious state.